So this is continuing of my time at, at Stony Brook. I was only in the hospital for five days, so before I was shipped off to rehab. <clears throat> and that woman's email that I read you before about how she wishes she could be herself again, how she'd really lost her sense of who she was and her sense of self. I can't tell you how true that is. When you lose your mind, especially when you're a smart thinking person, you know, I was a fairly high functioning individual. I had a very high pressure job in New York, and sort of pretty bright guy. Um, you know, I had a very high IQ, probably like most of you here. So for me to lose my brain and lose my mind and my ability to think clearly was really, really tough. It was a very, very hard thing. Um, so I'm a water person. And I know that water is not for everyone. Some people are happier on land, walking in the woods, tending their gardens, or working on their lawns. Others are more at home in the desert or the mountains. Water is my home, and I'm thankful I've discovered that truth at a young age. Some of us never do find out who we really are. And this day, as we sailed into the vast open horizon, I knew that I was going to be okay. I was home. So this chapter is, I'm out sailing on my sailboat, basically. It reminded me of my first memory in the hospital. Dr. James Davis, the head of neurology at Stony Brook, had come into my room, trailed by a retinue of interns and residents. He was a big, gentle bear of a man with a salt and pepper beard and a calming, soothing bedside manner. I must have been holding on tight to myself up until that moment, scared and anxious that I would end up like my mother, waiting for the next thing to hit me. But his reassuring words, tone and demeanor, put me at ease. I felt my entire being let out a big, long sigh. I knew I would not spend the rest of my life as an invalid in a wheelchair like my mother. I knew that I was going to be okay. I knew that I was going to be home. Um, he did that without any uh, tools, you know, without any monitors, without anything other than just who he was. <clears throat> that was his tool. That was uh, the thing that he possessed that was the most healing and the most uh, important to me. I'll tell you a story that's not in the book. <clears throat> he um, was a private pilot. He was a, an amateur private pilot. His daughter had written her first book, a novel, and so he took some time off from work to fly her around to do book signings around the East Coast, he and his wife and his daughter, in their private plane. Um, so I'm down in Florida going through rehab. I'm down there and, uh, because that's where my father lived and I could live with him and he could take me to rehab. Um, somehow Stony Brook lost my contact information. And I, I had been coming back, even though I was being treated in Florida and had very good doctors there, I would come back every few months just to see Dr. Davis, just to get sort of a baseline and he wanted to keep seeing me because I knew I'd be moving back to Long Island eventually when I got out of rehab. So I call up his office and talk to his secretary to set up an appointment. This is about, I don't know, nine months after my accident. And she says, oh my God, we've been trying to find you. You didn't hear. And I said, I didn't hear what? Why have you been trying to find me? She said, Dr. Davis is dead. He was in a plane accident. He was flying his daughter and his wife around. He flew into the side of a mountain in North Carolina and died. And we've been trying to get a hold of all of his patients, and you were one of the few people that we didn't have contact info for. I, I'm a pretty strong person usually. I just broke down sobbing. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, that, that lifeline, having been yanked out from under me at that time in my life, was just so disheartening and just so... Um, tough and difficult. You know, I, I had all these other doctors, I had family, I had all sorts of things, but this was the man who had treated me, who had first told me that I was going to be okay. And, you know, he didn't lie to me. He didn't know what being okay even meant, and I wouldn't ever encourage any of you to, you know, lie to any, any families or patients, because a lot of times, you know, traumatic brain injury patients are not going to be okay in the conventional sense of the word. They're never going to recover fully. They're never going to be, you know, themselves again. <coughs> but, it was that sense that in some way, in some way, shape, or form, however things worked out, it was going to be okay, that he was able to give to me. That was his gift. Um, and however 
you know, and if you can, can get that gift, maybe you have it already, some of us are born with it, I know I'm not. <laughs> so I work at it every day. Um, I'm a Zen Buddhist, I meditate, that's one of the ways that I sort of stay calm and compassionate and, and loving. Um, so I would just encourage you to, you know, in your bag of tricks, along with your stethoscopes and your monitors and everything else, to try and, and find that, that piece, that, that tool, and, and throw it in your bag of tricks.